Section 7. The Advance of Between the Lines by Boyd Cable. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The attack has resulted in our line being advanced from one to two hundred yards along a front of over one thousand yards. Official dispatch. Down to the rawest hand in the latest joint drafts, everyone knew for a week before the attack commenced that something was on, and for twenty-four hours before that the something was a move of some importance no mere affair of a battalion or two or even of brigades but of divisions and corps and armies there had been vague stirrings in the regiments far behind the firing line in rest refittings and completings of kits reissuing of worn equipments and a most ominous anxiety that each man was duly equipped with an identity disc the tell-tale little badge that hangs always round the neck of a man on active service and that bears the word of who he is when he is brought in wounded, who he was when brought in dead. The old hands judged all the signs correctly and summed them up in a sentence, being fattened for the slaughter, and were in no degree surprised when the sudden order came to move. Those farthest back moved up the first stages by daylight, but when they came within reach of the rumbling guns they were halted and bivouacked to wait for night to cloak their movements from the prying eyes of the enemy planes. The enemy might have, probably had, an inkling of the coming attack, but they might not know exactly the portion of front selected for the heaviest pressure, and this must be kept secret till the last possible moment. So the final filing up into the forward and support trenches was done by night, and was so complete by daylight that no sign of unwanted movement could be discerned from the enemy trenches and observing stations when day broke. It was a beautiful morning, soft and mildly warm and sunny, with just a slight haze hanging low to tone the growing light, and incidentally to delay the opening of fire from the guns. Anyone standing midway between the forward-firing trenches might have looked in vain for living side of the massed hordes waiting the word to bid each other's throats. Looking forward from behind the British lines, it could be seen that the trenches and parapets were packed with men, but no man showed head over parapet, and seen from the enemy's side, the parapets presented blank, lifeless walls. The trenches gave no glimpse of life. All the bustle and movement of the night before was finished. At midnight every road and track leading to the forward trenches had been brimming with men, with regiments tramping slowly or squatting stolidly by the roadside, smoking much and talking little, had been crawling with transport, with ammunition carts and ambulances and stretcher parties, and sappers heavily laden with sandbags and rolls of barbed wire. The trenches, support, communication, and firing had trickled with the creeping rivulets of khaki caps and been a bristle with bobbing rifle barrels. Further back, amongst the lines of guns, the last loads of ammunition were rumbling up to the batteries, the last shells required to complete establishment, and over-completed, were being stowed in safe proximity to the guns. At midnight there were scores of thousands of men and animals busily at work with preparations for the slaughter pen of the morrow. Before midnight came again the bustle would be renewed, and the circling ripples of activity would be spreading and widening from the central splash of the battle front till the last waves washed back to Berlin and London, brimming the hospitals and swirling through the munition factories. But now at daybreak the battlefield was steeped in brooding calm. Across the open space of the neutral ground a few trench periscopes peered anxiously for any sign of movement and saw none. The battery's forward observing officers, tucked away in carefully chosen and hidden lookouts, fidgeted with wrist watches and field glasses, and passed back by telephone continual messages about the strength of the growing light and the lifting haze. An aeroplane droned high overhead, and an Archibald, an anti-aircraft gun, or two, began to pattern the sky about it with a trail of fleecy white smoke puffs. The plane sailed on and out of sight, the smoke puffs and the wheezy barks of Archibald receding after it. Another period of silence followed, 
It was broken by a faint report like the sound of a far-off door being slammed, and almost at the same instant there came to the ear the faint, thin whistle of an approaching shell. The whistle rose to a rush and a roar that cut off abruptly in a thunderous bang. The shell pitched harmlessly on the open ground between the forward and support trenches. Again came the faint slam, this time repeated by four, and a bouquet of four shells crumped down almost on top of the support line. The four crashes might have been a signal to the British guns. About a dozen reports thudded out quickly and separately, and then in one terrific blast of sound the whole line broke out in heavy fire. The infantry in the trenches could distinguish the quick following bangs of the gun directly in line behind them, could separate the vicious swish and rush of the shells passing immediately over their heads. Apart from these, the reports blent in one long, throbbing, pulse of noise, an indescribable medley of moanings, shrieks, and whistling in the air rent by the passing shells. So ear-filling and confused was the clamour that the first sharp sudden bursts of the enemy shells over our trenches were taken by the infantry for their own artillery shells falling short, but a very few moments proved plainly enough that the enemy were replying vigorously to our fire. They had the ranges well marked, too, and huge rents began to show in our parapets. Strings of casualties began to trickle back to the dressing stations in a stream that was to flow steady and unbroken for many days and nights. But the enemy defences showed more and quicker signs of damage, especially at the main points, where the massed guns were busy breaching the selected spots. Here the lighter guns were pouring a hurricane of shrapnel on the dense thickets of barbed wire entanglements piled in loose loops and coils, strung in a criss-cross network between pegs and stakes along the edge of the neutral ground. The howitzers and heavies were pounding and hammering at the parapets and the communication trenches beyond. For half an hour the appalling uproar continued. The solid earth shook to the roar of the guns and the crashing of the shells. By the end of that time both fronts, to a depth of hundreds of yards, were shrouded in a slow-drifting haze of smoke and dust, through which the flashes of the bursting shell blazed in quick glares of vivid light, and the spots of their falling were marked by gushes of smoke and upflung billowing clouds of thick dust. So far the noise was only and all of guns and shell fire, but now from far out on one of the flanks a new note began to weave itself into the uproar, the sharper crackle and clatter of rifle and machine-gun fire. Along the line of front marks for the main assault, the guns suddenly lifted their fire, and commenced to pour it down further back, although a number of the lighter guns continued to sweep the front parapet with gusts of shrapnel. And then suddenly it could be seen that the front British trench was alive and astir. The infantry, who had been crouched and prone in the shelter of the trenches, rose suddenly and began to clamber over the parapets into the open, and make their way out through the maze of their own entanglements. Instantly the parapet opposite began to crackle with rifle fire and to beat out a steady tattoo from the hammering machine guns. The bullets hissed and spat across the open and hailed upon the opposite parapet. Scores, hundreds of men fell before they could clear the entanglements to form up in the open, dropped as they climbed the parapet or even as they stood up and raised a head above it. But the mass poured out, shook itself roughly into line and began to run across the open. They ran for the most part with shoulders hunched and heads stooped, as men would run through a heavy rainstorm to a near shelter. And as they ran, they stumbled and fell and picked themselves up and ran again, or crumpled up and lay still or squirming feebly. As the line swept on doggedly, it thinned and shredded into broken groups. The men dropped under the rifle bullets singly or in twos and threes. The bursting shells tore great gaps in the line, snatching a dozen men at a mouthful. Here and there, where it ran into the effective sweep of a maxim, the line simply withered and dropped and stayed still in a string of huddled heaps, amongst and on which the bullets continued to drum and thud. The open ground was a full hundred yards across at the widest point where the main attack was delivering. Fifty yards across, the battalion assaulting was no longer a line, but a scattered series of groups like beads on a broken string. Sixty yards across, and the groups had dwindled to single men, and couples with desperately long intervals between. 
seventy yards, and there were no more than odd occasional men, with one little bunch near the centre that had by some extraordinary chance escaped the sleet of bullets. At eighty yards a sudden swirl of lead caught this last group, and the line at last was gone, wiped out. The open was swept clear of those dogged runners. The open ground was dotted thick with men, men lying prone and still, men crawling on hands and knees, men dragging themselves slowly and painfully with trailing, useless legs, men limping, hobbling, staggering in a desperate endeavour to get back to their parapet and escape the bullets and shrapnel that still stormed down upon them. The British gunners dropped their ranges again, and a deluge of shells and shrapnel burst crashing and whistling upon the enemy's front parapet. The rifle fire slackened and almost died, and the last survivors of the charge had such chance as was left by the enemy's shells to reach the shelter of their trench. Groups of stretcher-bearers leaped out over the parapet and ran to pick up the wounded, and hard on their heels another line of infantry swarmed out and formed up for another attack. As they went forward at a run, the roar of rifles and machine-guns swelled again, and the hail of bullets began to sweep across to meet them. Into the forward trench they had vacated, the stream of another battalion poured, and had commenced to climb out in their turn, before the advancing line was much more than halfway across. This time the casualties, although appallingly heavy, were not so hopelessly severe as in the first charge, probably because a salient of the enemy trench to a flank had been reached by a battalion further along, and the devastating enfilading fire of rifles and machine guns cut off. This time the broken remnants of the line reached the barbed wires, gathered in little knots as the individual men ran up and down along the face of the entanglements looking for the lanes cut clearest by the sweeping shrapnel, streamed through with men still falling at every step, reached the parapet and leaped over and down. The guns had held their fire on the trench till the last possible moment, and now they lifted again and sought to drop across the further lines and the communication trenches a shrapnel curtain through which no reinforcements could pass and live. The following battalion came surging across, losing heavily, but still bearing weight enough to tell when at last they poured in over the parapet. The neutral ground, the deadly open and exposed space, was won. It had been crossed at other points, and now it only remained to see if the hold could be maintained, and strengthened and extended. The fighting fell to a new phase, the work of the short-arm bayonet thrust and the bomb-throwers. In the gaps between the points where the trench was taken, the enemy fought with the desperation of trapped rats. The trench had to be taken traverse by traverse. The bombers lobbed their missiles over into the traverse ahead of them in showers, and immediately the explosions crashed out, swung round the corner with a rush to be met in turn with bullets or bursting bombs. Sometimes a space of two or three traverses was blasted bare of life and rendered untenable for long minutes on end by a constant succession of grenades and bombs. In places the men of one side or the other leaped up out of the trench, risking the bullets that sleeted across the level ground and emptied a clip of cartridges or hurled half a dozen grenades down into the trench further along. But for the most part the fight raged below ground level, at times even below the level of the trench floor, where a handful of men held out in a deep dugout. If the entrance could be reached, a few bombs speedily settled the affair, but where the defenders had hastily blocked themselves in with a barricade of sandbags or planks, so that grenades could not be pitched in, there was nothing left to do but crowd in against the rifle muzzles that poked out and spurted bullets from the openings, tear down the defences, and so come at the defenders. And all the time the captured trench was pelted by shells, high explosive and shrapnel. At the entrances of the communication trenches that led back to the support trenches, the fiercest fighting raged continually, with men struggling to block the path with sandbags, and others striving to tear them down, while on both sides their fellows fought over them with bayonet and butt. In more than one such place the barricade was at last built by the heap of the dead who had fought for possession. In others crude barriers of earth and sandbags were piled up and fought across and pulled down and built up again a dozen times. 
In the middle of the ferocious individual hand-to-hand -hand fighting, a counter-attack was launched against the captured trench. A swarm of the enemy leaped from the next trench and rushed across the twenty or thirty yards of open to the captured front line. But the counter-attack had been expected. The guns caught the attackers as they left their trench and beat them down in scores. A line of riflemen had been installed under cover of what had been the parapet of the enemy front trench, and this line broke out in the mad minute of rifle fire. The shrapnel and the rifles between them smashed the counter-attack before it had well formed. It was cut down in swaths and had totally collapsed before it reached halfway to the captured trench. But another was hurled forward instantly, was up out of the trench and streaming across the open before the infantry had finished recharging their magazines. Then the rifles spoke again in rolling crashes. The screaming shrapnel pounced again on the trench that still erupted hurrying men, while from the captured trench itself came hurtling bombs and grenades. Smoke and dust leaped and swirled in dense clouds above the trenches and the open between them, but through the haze the ragged front fringe of the attack loomed suddenly and pressed on to the very lip of the trench. Beyond that point it appeared it could not pass. The British infantry, cramming full cartridge clips into their magazines, poured a fresh cataract of lead across the broken parapet into the charging ranks, and the ranks shivered and stopped and melted away beneath the fire, while the remnants broke and fled back to cover. With a yell, the defenders of a moment before became the attackers. They leaped the trench and fell with the bayonet on the flying survivors of the counter-attack. For the most part, these were killed as they fled, but here and there groups of them turned at bay, and in a dozen places as many fights raged bitterly for a few minutes while the fresh attack pushed on to the next trench. A withering fire poured from it, but could not stop the rush that fought its way on and into the second-line trench. From now the front lost connection or cohesion. Here and there the attackers broke in on the second line, exterminated that portion of the defense in its path, or was itself exterminated there. Where it won footing, it spread raging to either side along the trench, shooting, stabbing, flinging hand grenades, and bearing down the defenders by the sheer fury of the attack. The movement spread along the line, and with a sudden leap and rush the second line was gained along a front of nearly a mile. In parts this attack overshot its mark, broke through and over the second line, and tearing and hacking through a network of wire into the third trench. In part the second line still held out, and even after it was all completely taken, the communication trenches between the first and second line were filled with combatants who fought on furiously, heedless of whether friend or foe held trench in front or rear, intent only on the business at their own bayonet points to kill the enemy facing them and push in and kill the ones behind. Fresh supports pressed into the captured positions, and backed by their weight the attack surged on again in a fresh spasm of fury. It secured foothold in great sections of the third line, and even without waiting to see the whole of it made good, attempted to rush the fourth line. At one or two points the gallant attempt succeeded, and a handful of men hung on desperately for some hours, their further advance impossible, their retreat had they attempted it almost equally so, cut off from reinforcements, short of ammunition, and entirely without bombs or grenades. When their ammunition was expended, they used rifles and cartridges taken from the enemy dead in the trench. Having no grenades, they snatched and hurled back on the instant any that fell with fuses still burning. They waged their unequal fight to the last minute, and were killed out to the last man. The third line was not completely held, or even taken. One or two loopholed and machine-gunned dugout redoubts, or keeps, held out strenuously, and before they could be reduced, entrance being gained at last literally by tearing the place down, sandbag by sandbag, till a hole was made and grenade after grenade flung in. Other parts of the trench had been recaptured. The weak point that so often hampers attack was making itself felt. The bombers and grenadiers had exhausted the stock they carried. Fresh supplies were scanty, were brought up with difficulty, and distributed to the most urgently required places with still greater difficulty. The ammunition carriers had to cross the open of the old neutral ground, 
the battered first trench, pass along communication trenches choked with dead and wounded, or again cross the open to the second and third line. All the time they were under the fire of heavy explosive shells and had to pass through a zone or barrage of shrapnel built across their path for just this special purpose of destroying supports and supplies. Our own artillery were playing exactly the same game behind the enemy lines, but in these lines were ample stores of cartridges and grenades, bombs and trench mortars. The third and fourth lines were within easy bomb and grenade throwing distance, and were connected by numerous passageways. On this front the contest became a bombing duel, and because the British were woefully short of bombs, and the enemy could throw five to their one, they were again bombed out and forced to retire. But by now the second trench had been put in some state of defence towards its new front, and here the British line stayed fast and set its teeth and doggedly endured the torment of the bombs and the destruction of the pounding shells. Without rest or respite, they endured till night, and on through the night, under the glare of flares and the long-drawn punishment of the shell-fire, until the following day brought with the dawn fresh supports for a renewal of the struggle. The battered fragments of the first attacking battalions were withdrawn, often with corporals for company leaders and lieutenants or captains commanding battalions whose full remaining strength would hardly make a company. The battle might only have been well begun, but at least, thanks to them and to those scattered heaps lying among the grass, spread in clumps and circles about the yawning shell-holes, buried beneath the broken parapets and in the smashed trenches, to them and those and these others passing out with haggard, pain-lined faces, shattered limbs and torn bodies on the red, wet stretchers to the dressing stations. At least the battle was well begun. The sappers were hard at work in the darkness consolidating the captured positions, and these would surely now be held firm. Whatever was to follow, these first regiments had done their share. Two lines of trenches were taken. The line was advanced. Advanced, it is true, a bare one or two hundred yards, but with lives poured out like water over every foot of the advance with every inch of the ground gained marking a well-spring and fountain-head of a river of pain, and of a suffering beyond all words, of a glory above and beyond all suffering. End of section 7